So welcome everyone. My name is Kathy Stovall. I'm with the Bermuda Hospitals Board in the Public Relations Department and this is the second of a series of four mini lunchtime talks we're having on the design and construction of the new wing. Today we are concentrating on LEED certification which is the energy saving aspects of the of the design. I suppose you would say. And my guest today is Travis Berlin. Welcome, Travis. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Who was the, he was the lead liaison for our project, and he's also the head of Bermuda Engineering. And uh, he, he worked in two capacities, actually. He worked in his capacity as head of Bermuda Engineering with the solar panels we have on the roof, and he was the lead liaison. So, welcome, Travis. Now, explain to us what LEED certification is. Um, thank you. Uh, well, I'll explain what LEED is first. LEED stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's basically a uh, not-for-profit not organization that assists and overviews the design, the construction, the occupancy, and the ongoing maintenance of facilities. So it's really sort of a third-party way of, of vetting uh, everything from the construction process right up to the final completion, ongoing maintenance of a facility to ensure that it's, um, I mean, it encompasses so many different things. It encompasses energy efficiency. It encompasses uh, people's health, safety within the building, indoor air quality. There's a lot of different components involved, but really the idea is to design and build buildings that are going to be safe for the occupants, safe for the construction workers involved, and it's going to have an ongoing sustainability component to it that's going to be efficient, cost effective, and, and effectively um, you know, going to reduce costs over the, over the longevity of the, the life cycle of the project and also, um, also significantly improve the health of, of the, uh, the people involved in the facility. Great, thanks very much for that. So, you said you were going to describe for us just what LEED is. So, describe for us now the certification process. Are there different levels of certification? You know, when I go to New York, I see these ratings for restaurants. They're A and B and C, and you always want to go to an A. You don't, you don't want to go to anything less. So, what, what's the certification aspect of this LEED? Yeah, the certification aspect is broken down into six major components um, throughout the course of the project. Um, I'll just go through the list here. That's uh, sustainable sites, water efficiency, energy and atmosphere, materials and resources, indoor environmental quality, and also innovation and design. So basically, there's different levels of LEED accreditation and depending on how many points that we receive in those different categories that will then you know give us a final you know point total for the whole project so depending on where we land within that final schedule we you know we may end up being LEED silver, LEED gold. The project was set up originally to be LEED certified which is sort of on the lower end of the scale but we've um, I've kind of rallied the guys and we're really trying to go for lead silver and we might even get lead gold on this so we're um, we're trying hard we're doing a lot of paperwork we're um, doing everything we can to get that certification because it surely would be a, a nice legacy project for Bermuda thanks very much and you say you're still working hard on that we, we see the building we've got the keys already how how can you how can you get further you, you, the building's done yeah and that, that's a great question there's a lot of um, there's a lot of paperwork that we're doing after the fact now so we're actually going through um, one of the big credits that I'm, I'm thinking of in particular is the recycled content credit and what that is 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 all the materials that are used on the hospital site um, we, we've tried to purchase and procure those uh, with some element of recycled content it's not exactly the easiest being in Bermuda because we don't exactly have access to 
the same recycled content materials that you might get if you were in the States or Canada or Europe. So right now I'm sort of retroactively going through um, all of the materials used on site. We've already met our minimum requirements, so we've certainly, we're on target for that, but now we're, we're going through the list of, uh, of all the different components in the building and just trying to pick out what the recycled content is in each of those and, and with a view to kind of bumping our recycled content percentage level um, to the next tier, which would get us effectively more points, more credits, which may then bump us into, uh, into a higher lead tier. Well, good luck with that. You mentioned recycled materials. What, which, can you share with us, would it be of interest of us to know um, which materials are recycled? I mean, do we have recycled block? Yeah, and that's, that's the interesting thing is that because we're in Bermuda, things like fly ash that you would often see as a, a high recycled content value in concrete, we just don't get here in Bermuda. Um, the biggest single line item ticket on the project that had high recycled content was the rebar. So all the structural rebar that went into the concrete to reinforce the building, that was uh, a significant value of recycled content. But now um, going into all the different smaller components, I mean, we've got structural steel, we've got a lot of the mechanical equipment, we've got um, certain components of the flooring, the ceiling, the, the um, EFIS. Um, so there are a lot of other components within the building, but um, certainly the higher cost ones, it, it's all based off cost. So we're really looking for the high cost components on the project primarily. So the rebar is, is hands down the, um, the highest value recycled content item in the project. And where did we get this rebar from? It, it makes me nervous when you say that the, the thing holding the building up is from recycled materials. I, I have this feeling that it might fall apart. No, it's a good question. It comes from, it actually comes from all over the world. There's not one specific supplier that the rebar came from. There's probably 15 different locations that it came from. And each one of those locations has to have a LEED certified document that, that confirms that it is recycled content. And we're talking about steel here. So we're talking about, you know, old bits of scrap metal that were used, put back, you know, melted back down and then reused again. So there's, there's different elements of recycled content. I mean, I don't want to get too technical in it. There's there's post-consumer, um, pre, pre-consumer, post-industrial recycled content, and the different levels of recycled content effectively add up to the, the final recycled content value. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, it does. Thanks very much. Um, I think it's very interesting the materials used on the construction site. Can you talk a bit more about which ones were energy efficient and, and how perhaps some of them helped with this LEED certification? The yeah, some, some of the materials used. I mean, I, I, we've got some of them here, like the um, lead line drywall. We've got mold resistant drywall. Um, are there any materials that, that come to mind right away? Yeah, I mean, certainly, certainly the drywall, and that, that it's an amazing drywall. I mean, it's the first drywall I've ever seen that you can literally leave outside in the rain for a week, and you pick it up, and it, it absolutely doesn't absorb any moisture whatsoever. So that's, that actually, that's actually more, um, not so much involved in recycled content, but, but certainly on the sustainability of the facility. If we ever had any, you know, we all know Bermuda is, is you know, a, a harbor for mold and mildew, so to have these sorts of components built into the facility certainly are going to help, um, you know, make it a much more sustainable um, facility over the longevity of the project. Um, I mean, there's so many different components within this building that are um, designed and installed in a way to really help this this building become more efficient. Um, one of the things that really jumps out is me, um, not so much a material, but more of a product, but it's a lighting system, is, is really pretty state of the art. Um, everything in the building is, is um, controlled by daylight dimming, so all, all the lighting that's near the outside of the building that has access to daylight um, also has sensors built into it, so you can actually tell, or this system will actually tell, you know, if it's bright outside, you'll see the lights will actually dim down and allow the sunlight to um, you know, be utilized more for the natural lighting. And then obviously if a cloud goes over, you'll see the lights brighten up again. There's also automatic um, window shades that go down um, that help with the lighting control and also help to reduce the thermal gain on the building at certain times of the day. Um, another one that I really find really interesting because it's, it's so simple but incredibly effective is 
the design of the actual building. I know you guys have seen the sort of outside of it, and it's got these big overhangs over a lot of the windows, and um, we call that passive solar design. And as simple as it is, it works so well. Um, basically, the, the concept behind that is that, you know, in the summertime, the sun ru runs on a much higher trajectory in the sky, and with those big overhangs, it, they're designed so that when the sun's high in the sky in the summer, when it's hot, when we don't want that heat in the building, that overhang shades the windows from getting any direct natural sunlight, so it keeps the heat away from the building. And then in the winter time, when the sun runs on a much lower azimuth in the sky, um, it allows that light in, that heat into the building when we want it. When in sort of December, January, February, we want you know we want to have a bit of thermal gain inside the building. We may not necessarily want to get rid of it. So just as simple as that is, it works so incredibly well, and it's it's one of these design features that, you know, we call it state of the art now, but it really isn't. It's something that we, you know, in Bermuda even, you know, 100, 150 years ago, we were building houses with, you know, all the southern exposure was, you know, you, you, you had full covered porches that, you know, encouraged natural flow through a breeze, but also stopped all that direct sunlight from, from entering the house. And now we still see people building, you know, houses on South Shore facing due south, and they look like greenhouses, and they wonder why their Belco bills are, you know, three thousand dollars a month to air condition it it's just it's such a simple concept again but it's it's so easy to get around it with with clever and and not necessarily cutting edge design thanks very much for that that's really interesting i i'll spread that i've never heard that before <laughs> that's very 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 interesting so can you tell us a bit more about the design of the new hospital and how lead might have impacted um, the decisions that were made in, in the actual design? I mean, you just mentioned that one. Yeah. Are there any others? Yeah, I mean, there's, there are so many design components to the hospital. I mean, I don't even know where to start. Um, I mean, the, the very setting out of the project, before we even sort of broke ground on site, we, um, we did an environmental assessment of the, of the site, of the soil, um, any contaminants that were sort of on site that we had found there from from previous occupants, uh, we cleaned that all up. So you know, just just from the get go, before we even started putting the building in place, uh, we we had cleaned things up to avoid any you know issues that may arise in the future, any contamination potential. Um, I mean, everything from from you know having this building close to to public transportation access, that was a significant factor in, in LEED. I mean, obviously, we, we were limited in where this facility could go, but we had to do a few things to keep it closer to public transportation. That's one of the design credits that um, just makes it a bit more accessible to the public. Um, and that, that's, that's one of the little design characteristics. Um, I mean, there's electric vehicle charging stations at, at the new um, parking lot here over the sewage treatment plant. That was input. That's, that's also um, sort of a LEED design credit. Uh, we've got a really extensive stormwater management system, so um, you know if we ever have heavy rains, uh, we're not looking at, at having a lot of silt sedimentation leaving the site. All of that is contained within the facility. Um, uh, there's, there's so many different things. Um, I mean, the white roofs, we're all used to that in Bermuda, but we actually do get credits for the low uh, CRI, it's the color rendering index. Um, we get we get more points for that for, for going with a lighter color on the roof. Uh, we actually do get um, some some extra credit points for our reuse of water. Um, I mean, as Bermudians, we take for granted the fact that we capture water off our roofs and and, and reuse it. But that that is considered pretty you know forward thinking by LEED standards in 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 sort of North America. So um, we're actually able to use all of the water captured off of the roof, and it goes into a separate dedicated basin, and that will be used to irrigate all of the plants around um, around the new the new site. So everything is very sustainable. And then even within the selection of those plants, we went through a sort of a rigorous process to make sure that we selected plants that were appropriate for our for you know our geographic location that were drought resistant that didn't need you know intensive watering or maintenance or care. So it was really you know simple little things like that, but they really do go quite a long way over the life cycle of this of this facility and not having to pay for water or to use you know you know precious potable water for you know irrigating plants so I mean you know that that was fairly relevant um, I mean all the HVAC equipment on site is is completely CFC free all 
uh, pardon me, HVAC stands for heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So basically the air conditioners, the refrigeration, um, anything used, um, any technology that uses that sort of, or anything that uses that technology would would be completely CFC free and also energy efficient. There's there's a sort of energy efficiency benchmark that we're, we're targeting. So basically, um, LEED have a sort of a pool of like buildings um, that they've kind of accumulated in the states and there's sort of an energy benchmark that we anticipate uh, a healthcare facility will consume and we have to exceed that by a certain percentage that sort of set standard or expected set standard so we actually had to implement and include you know different appliances or different pieces of equipment lighting systems all the controls so that we ensure that you know the the energy consumption of this facility is low as possible um, you know we're storing and rec recycling um, all the materials on each floor of the building um, I mean it's 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 so encompassing I mean e right down to the janitor's closets all those chemicals that the janitors would typically put in like a closed closet um, that can kind of accumulate some strong VOCs in there. All those janitor closets are all ventilated to the outside now. So every single storage closet in the building is all vented to the outside, which is, you know, unheard of on, on a project I've ever been on. So really kind of going above and beyond and, and wherever improvements can be made and, and you know, cost-effective improvements, I, I should say, uh, we've really looked at implementing those. Um, I, I've... I've got quite a list here. I can I could ramble on all day, but I won't bore you guys. Um, the other one, actually, I think is worth mentioning is the um, management of the indoor or the outside air inside the building. Um, traditional facilities would either would typically have just a, a standard inflow of outside air, but as we know, Bermuda, that outside air is is hot, it's humid, so. In the hospital, there's actually a system. It's, it's called a makeup air system, and there's carbon dioxide sensors on all floors and all levels. Um, and those sensors actually centrally control this makeup air unit, so that it's all based off of CO2. So if CO2 levels get below a preset point, it's going to open up this valve on the roof, introduce more hot air into the air conditioning system, and then shut it off. So it's really it's, it's maintaining a, a safe, healthy standard of air quality, but not introducing too much outside hot, humid air that's going to be expensive for us to condition, cool down, dehumidify, and then circulate through the building. So things like that really go a, an extremely long way in um, the sort of ongoing energy efficiency of the facility. Thank you very much. I was frightened I would never see it again. <laughs> um, Travis, you were also involved in the solar panels up on the roof. Those are, I think, they create the lar they represent the largest um, outfit of that kind on the island. Can you tell us a bit about the energy saving there and sort of, I don't know how much power they they produce. Yeah, we um, yeah we were proud to to complete the solar hot water system at the new hospital. It comprises of uh, 26 40 square foot thermal collectors. Uh, it's, that's just over a thousand square feet of solar thermal collection area, and we we actually produce up to 900 gallons of, of hot solar water that would feed the top three floors. So the top three floors of the new hospital are all the the patient wings. So this actually serves as a preheat. Um, to the backup boilers for all of those floors. So, you know, if anyone's in that new hospital anytime soon, you can at least be happy to know that you're utilizing some nice renewable energy and, and, and solar hot water. It's, it's, I think, Bermuda's biggest solar hot water system to date. Um, it's, and it's amazing how much hot water it produces. We've been uh, monitoring it since it's been commissioned, and uh, there's going to be plenty of hot water up there. You're not going to have to worry about running out anytime soon. <laughs> 900 gallons you said so 900 gallons a day uh. it's um it's not quite as easy to answer as that because obviously a cloudy day and a sunny day you'll get different production figures but the storage component of the system is a big 900 gallon system that then feeds the backup heating system so say for instance we had 
you know, five days of cloudy inclement weather, you're still going to get quite a lot of production from the solar hot water system. It'll take that stored tank water from, say, 70 degrees and bump it up to at least 90, 95, maybe 100 degrees. And then what happens is it, it'll then go to uh, a sort of more traditional boiler. And if that water isn't up to the temperature that, that's required in the building, that boiler will kick in and just bump it up that last little bit. It'll provide that heat to heat it up to the, the preset temperature that we need in the facility. Um, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Yes, it does. Thanks very much. So, um, it looks like you did a lot of things to comply with LEED and, and you're still looking to get more points with LEED. Was it more difficult trying to work to this LEED certification? Um, yeah, I mean, it certainly is, is, it's more challenging than just going out there and putting a building up. It's, you know, we're certainly, um, restricted by certain things we can do on site, certain things we can do in the design of the building, but um, you know, all in all, it's so worthwhile to do this, even though it was, you know, particularly the beginning of the project with a lot of the, the sub-trade, subcontractors, not having much experience with the lead project before and sort of that teething period in the beginning, getting people to kind of have the buy-in um, of the whole concept of it. So it was, you know, a little bit of a challenge in the beginning, but what we did was sort of try and create a a lead champion within each of the sub trades so that you know we had one person that we could go to that would sort of look out for any deficiencies and make sure everyone was sort of doing things at, according to lead and making sure we stayed on track so you know it was certainly more more work than than a standard project but you know the fact is now that we've built a building a facility that's so much better than than it would be without this lead component and that's that's talking about right from the beginning of the project the construction I mean we've you know we've been able to really protect the people inside the facility while we're building it we've been able to maintain you know nice air quality throughout the whole property tell, tell us a bit about what's it, the, the the air quality, the air quality yeah in the, on the construction. yeah um, that this was a big I, w I, I was really involved in this one. It was uh, the credit was indoor air quality before occupancy. So what we had to do was, throughout the whole project, we had to maintain a number of different initiatives um, to make sure that we stayed compliant. Um, I mean that included everything from, you know, not allowing tobacco smoke inside the building, which is pretty obvious. Uh, we would store all gasoline, any solvents, anything that had a high VOC. Um, amount all of that was stored outside of the building in the, in cages that we locked every night. Um, we would restrict vehicles around the building, so any any vehicle that you know uses gas or diesel has any potential to produce carbon monoxide. We would restrict them around the buildings because you wouldn't want to be working in inside and have a a big payload or dumping diesel fumes right next to you. So things like that that you know were were not as difficult to regulate, but just you know with signage and with kind of informing the, the guys on site of what to look out for. Um, yeah, I mean, inside the building there was electric and, electric and uh, natural gas powered equipment. Do you want me to keep going? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go all day. No, in particular, there, there were these big like tubes that were pumping air in, and I wanted to include those in this exhibition, but they tell me it was the first time they were on island and that they're gone, they've gone to some some construction site in Florida. So I was hoping you would talk about that. <laughs> yeah, those were those were effectively big um, AC units with um, they were uh, HEPA filters built into them, so they would circulate air on each of the floors. It, it was a two-part system. The the big units that you saw outside were the conditioning systems that would remove the humidity from the building and also cool the air and run it through the filters. And then we had, within the building, we had these circulatory systems. It was like a temporary ductwork system that would take that, that cool dehumidified air that was exhausted into the building and it would then circulate it all the way around because as, as construction was going on, we went from big open floor plans to, you know, it turned into a maze at the end of the project. There were all these different, you know, areas and nooks and crannies so we had a big sort of uh, it, was a, it, 
was about a 12 inch diameter plastic sleeve that was hooked up to a big fan and it was so simple but so effective and they would cut little slits in the sleeve at areas that they needed specific ventilation or they needed to get that cool dehumidified air to so we were able to you know get nice air flow um, not only to protect the equipment and protect the facility but also for the workers to you know keep a nice controlled environment for them to keep the dust levels down to keep the moisture levels down to avoid any mold and mildew during during construction so that that was effectively what that system was all about and it worked really well first time I had ever used it. Thanks very much. Okay, I'm I'm noticing the time. I'm aware of the time. So, at this point, I'll, I'll take questions from the floor. Does anyone have a question for Mr. Berlin? No. We're probably going to find out uh, towards the end of this year. There's a few outstanding things that, that we're waiting on that are going to need a bit of uh, sort of post-occupancy data on. There's some sort of comfort and verification and control of the systems. Um, there's some indoor air quality testing that we'll do after the, the facility is actually occupied. Um, so the majority of the lead work is, is going to be in before that. So I think we're going to know where we're going to fall as far as our lead uh, lead sort of creditation long before we actually get it. But there's there are one or two outstanding um, lead items that, that just physically need to happen, you know, three, four months from now, just so that it's sort of a double check on a lot of the things that we've done now and done to date. So really just coming in at the end of the project after it's been handed over, after the occupants have been in for two or three months, and we're, we're just going to recheck everything, recheck um, with all the occupants to make sure everything is, is at the levels that they expect it to be. Okay, thanks very much.